that's, that's the this. name of this magic carpet. Right? of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. verse again just because I like it, okay? We're going to sing it one more time in this new key. Here we go. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we hold get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be old soon those pearly gates will open we Tread the streets of gold When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be yeah. When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout We'll sing and shout We'll sing and shout the victory be I want to be close close to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one hallelujah holy holy god almighty you're the great i am who is worthy none beside thee god almighty you're the great i am i want to be near near to your heart loving the world and hating the dark i want to see dry bones living again singing as one hallelujah holy holy god almighty you're the great i am The 
and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am God, you're a mighty God. You're the great I am. God, we're so blessed, God, that you made a way for us to worship. You made a way for us to get to heaven. And that's Jesus Christ, your son, the one and only. He gave his life for us. And God, we bless you this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for the very privilege we have to, uh, to be before you. God, online and in the building this morning, God, what a, what a privilege it is, Lord, to love you and, God, to give our all to you this morning. God, it's my prayer that we just kind of raise our hands and surrender this morning and just say, Lord, have your way. God, have your way in our lives. My life, each life, Lord, uh, has to be done individually, God, even though we can pray for an in, in intercession and for the Holy Spirit to have his way, God, we still have to let you in. We have to submit ourselves unto your authority. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd find that this morning as we worship. I pray as we sung that song a moment ago when we all get to heaven that we realize, God, the world, the only hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. I talked to about that and the folks may be listening from Brookhaven this morning and talked about that in the funeral this week and so God I pray God I pray that we would take hold God you told us in 1st Thessalonians that you don't want us to be ignorant or uninformed but that we can have hope <laughs> and that hope is in Jesus Christ God I pray that people would learn to run to Jesus my heart's heavy this morning, God, just because so many folks want to do it their way. They say it's their life. Leave them alone, let them go, let them do what they want. God, it's just not that way. And God, you called us to live in a life that's in obedience to you, God. You called us to be our brother's keeper. You called us to make good decisions. You called us to, Lord, display and magnify God in all that we do. So, God, I pray this morning, God, that we would relinquish control of our life, that we would give it to you. God, I pray for the Christian, the born-again one who's uh, living away from you right now, not where they need to be. I pray, God, that they would find their way back, that they would go back to the last point of disobedience and come back to you. And then, God, I pray for that individual who's never cried out to you for their salvation for forgiveness of sin and repentance, God, and turning from their sin, turning to you. I pray for them this morning. And God, I thank you for answered prayers. So many this week, God, and I just bless you for it. Thank you, God, for all that you do, God. What a mighty God we serve. The great I am. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for giving our special times this morning. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated this morning. So good to see you, and glad that you're with us this morning. 
Uh, I know we were running short on worship guides, but I think we can cover you this morning. And uh, if you don't have one, if you'll just slip your hand up right there, we'll get you a worship guide. Uh, just up and down, and uh, they'll get to you. And uh, as you get that, let me just invite you, as you're a first-time guest, that you will uh, fill out the Connect card there. And uh, turn it in. You can drop it in the offering boxes when you leave, or you can leave it on the pew, and we'll get it from you. Um, we'd love to have that, okay? So do that for me. Um, let me just say a couple of words on announcements. Uh, of course, the COVID stuff going on and the rise in COVID stuff. We're not doing Bible study for the next, uh, we didn't do it today and we won't do it next week. Um, and then we just ask you to just be aware and uh, do what you can do uh, to protect you and others. Um, also, the let me remind you about the Jackson County Association. We got a special opportunity um, that um, takes place this Friday night. They're having a worship band at 5.30. Game starts at 6.30, I think, and they're going to do big fireworks afterwards and all of that. And the tickets are $9, but you have to use the code FAITH when you go in to get them online. You go to the uh, Biloxi Shuckers website, and uh, that's a reserve section, and uh, it's going to be good. And uh, so it gives you an opportunity to go out to the ball game with the family. And uh, they're doing a special raid and all that for Jackson County. But if you know some other Use that and, and take them. That'll be great. So I wanted to make sure we get that across to you. Celebrate Recovery. We'll meet this afternoon uh, from 5 to 7. Not doing any other extra activities, but we want to make sure that Celebrate Recovery meets. And uh, be praying for that. We'd love for you to come and worship at 5 o'clock, and then you'll be done by 6. Um, and uh, unless you want to stay for the 101 stuff, and uh, you can do that as well. Let me, uh, I mentioned the answered prayer to you. Let me just say a word to you. Uh, both Johnny Johnson and George Smith came home this week. And uh, praise God for that. Um, yeah, give God a hand. 43 days for Johnny in the hospital, most of which was on the vent, all right? Uh, George, uh, most of you know that story. Um, I think George and Geraldine are listening this morning. He called me last night just to talk, and uh, you know how much we all love them. And, uh, you know, on the vent for four months. And uh, now he, he, the, he's taken, uh, I don't know, 50 steps or so with a walker, and uh, they discharged him from the hospital, and then he'll start his therapy here and all of that. And here's the other miracle. They told him in the hospital that they didn't think they were going to be able to take the trach out right away, and they were going to have to do some uh, laser surgery and different things like that, and he was going to have to go back to New Orleans. Well, I don't know how it all worked out, okay? But... They got him to a doctor in Ocean Springs, and I don't even know who it is. But on Friday, they took the trach out, sealed it up with no surgery. They told him that he wouldn't be able to talk. Unless he held his hand over it, but he can talk normal. And uh, so another miracle of God. Uh, and so just uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, so I want you to continue to pray for Jay Price. Uh, Jay's still in ICU. Uh, in isolation, and uh, so we just need to pray that Joe gets stronger and stronger. And then Miss Kathy and Brother Walter are here, but Miss Kathy had a heart cath this week and had a stent put in, and Brother Walter had back surgery. And so, anyway, just remember them. Um, got some folks fighting battles with the uh, with the uh, variant, um, the Delta variant. Uh, Amber's got a friend, Sam. Uh, it's a lady, Samantha, who's just put on the vent last night. And uh, so I just pray for her. And then Ariel, I ask you to be praying for her. Uh, and then I want you to be, I was looking for Norman and Tish. I don't see them. Uh, huh? Oh, okay. Um, Norman and Tish, I want you to be praying for them because this next weekend, many of you don't know, and I don't know the exact number of years, but uh, Norman has not been able to see his daughters. He's got two of them. Uh, for a number of years, okay? Norman found out some months ago that they thought he was dead. They had been told he was dead. And uh, so Norman has been in working with Georgia and the state, and the girls are in foster care. Uh, this coming weekend, Norman is going to see uh, one of the daughters. And uh, first time. And uh, it looks like in the near future they're going to be coming, to, or one of them is going to be coming to live with them. And uh, they're working through these processes. So she's 15. And uh, so I want you just to be praying for them and uh, get a chance to encourage them. <clears throat> it's fun.
fun to see God work. <laughs> and just see what all he does. And the beauty of his grace. So I want you to be praying. Uh, I think they leave on Friday. And they'll have two visits while they're there over the weekend. So uh, I encourage you just to be praying for them. And they, these others, especially Jay, as he tries to uh, get stronger and stronger. I had a good visit with him this week. And uh, so just pray for him. Pray for his dad, Jim, in Starkville. And uh, he hadn't been able to see him at one time. And uh, so. That's pretty much it. I'll just kind of hush up, Jim. Let's take. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over. You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming never Reckless love of God Oh, He chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. I was reading a book this week, and we're talking about, you know, how dark times and tough times and all of that. And the pilot said, you know what's awesome is that it, it was a pilot, and he was talking, and he said, what is amazing is that no matter what the weather's like off the ground, once I get to a certain height, it's always sunny. As long as the sun's out at that time, no matter what is, is there on the ground, once I get to a certain height, guess what? It's still sunny. It looks like it's cloudy. It looks like it's stormy. It looks like these times we just can't make it through. But guess what? We go above that and God's still right there, ready to just embrace us and love us and just help us through. My Jesus, I love Thee. I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the families of sin just because I love that third verse, so I get to sing the third and the fourth. All right, y'all sing it with us, okay? In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in One with God, the Lord most 
this morning we can call on you in the midst of tough times in the midst of times where we don't have answers or just any time and God you said if anyone lacks wisdom let them ask because you give to everyone without finding fault you give to everyone liberally generously and you don't look for fault you don't determine if they're at fault, if they're doing the wrong thing, whatever. You just simply will grant wisdom to us in the midst of all of our times of question. And so, God, we're asking you for, for wisdom in all of our lives. I know I'm asking it for me in my life. I want your wisdom. I need your wisdom. I want the best possible outcome I can get. And we call on the mighty name of Jesus yes, for everything and anything mm. at all times. Yes, There's nothing too big that God can't handle and nothing too small that he doesn't care about. Mm. Thank you, Lord. We can call on the yes. powerful, wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus anytime. So God, thank you for that opportunity 
thank you for making that possible. And God, I pray that that would just be in our heart, that this week, today, right now, we would really focus on calling on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you. Be seated. Take your copy of God's Word this morning. Go to Song of Songs, chapter 5. Continue the trek through uh, Song of Songs. Thank you for the comments last Sunday. Uh, you know, and I had somebody come to me and say, you know, I was studying that on Friday, and I didn't understand it. And I come here on Sunday, and then you're preaching that, that message. And uh, um, sat down and had a long talk with them about it. And just... Uh, you know, that's just, you never know how God's working in the midst of what's going on. I told you last Sunday, you know, we looked at the marital bliss, we looked at what it's supposed to be, and then we got into the sexuality of it last Sunday. And uh, today, I told you that uh, chapter 5, these first, uh, first two through eight, um, first conflict didn't take long for Solomon and Shulam to have a conflict, right? And so that's what we're going to kind of look at in the midst of the moment. Uh, verses 2 through 8. Um, we don't know exactly how much time had passed. There had been some time uh, that had passed. And we don't know exactly the time frame of that, but it wasn't long. And uh, they're at this point. And so look with me there at Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2, and following to verse 8. Um, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice. My beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew. This is Solomon talking. My locks with the damp of the night. I have taken off my dress. This goes to Shulamith. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. I rose to open to my beloved, and my hands drip with the myrrh and fingers with liquid myrrh um, on the handles of the boat. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but I did, he did not answer me. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. Weird verse right there in the middle, right? Going to make a couple of comments about that in just a little bit. I jure, I challenge you, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, as to what you will tell him, uh, for I am lovesick. Uh, so he, she actually placed them under oath right there. If you find him, then I want you to tell him that I'm lovesick. Let's go Lord. Father, I pray that you help us to understand your word more and more. And God, to get into the poetry of that and try to break it all down, because when we read it, uh, without studying it, God, we're wondering what in the world is all that saying. So God, help us with that this morning. Holy Spirit of God, that you cover us and speak into us uh, this morning. That's my prayer, God, that you would do that uh, in the midst of wherever we are, uh, in our life, in the midst of relationships, in the midst of marriage, uh, the different things that's going on in life. God, help us to look at that in a real way, in a godly way. Uh, in a way that honors you, Lord. So we ask you to just bless this time, God. Open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears and our spiritual mind and our spiritual heart so that we might receive and, and understand the precious, precious, precious word of God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, when you think about life, how busy it is, I mean, how quickly it passes. Uh, I did the funeral this week for a 41-year-old man. Uh, I watched that young man in his early years, and I saw some things, and I watched and saw what God was doing in his life, and uh, I uh, saw God move in his life, and then Jeffrey went through a tragic accident, and paralyzed from the neck down. I did his funeral this week, and talked to his precious mom and family and, and just talk to them about the, the, how quickly life passes and the fact that we're not guaranteed for tomorrow. So what do we do with the moments that we have? And so that's what I say to you this morning. So many of us spend time uh, settling for less than what God really wants us to have. We settle for less than God's best. And, um, you know, I, I want you to see if nothing else coming out of Song of Songs, if you haven't followed through all the messages, go back and look at them. 
and, and really think about what God wants to do in your life, what God really has in store. Um, I want you to realize, first of all, we say it, but I want you to come to terms with the fact that life is bigger than we are. Marriage is bigger than we are. Um, relationships are bigger than we are. Um, I mean, so much more than we ever thought. And I, I want to kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, you know, some even might say, boy, I got more than a bargain for. Uh, just being real. And, and you had to back up and really look at some things. And so, uh, you know, we looked at God's goal for, for all of us. The marriage bliss, the happiness, the joy, the fact that God created marriage and he created it for a reason. And, uh, you know, doing things God's way and, and watching the blessings of God. Um, to have the fulfillment in every area, uh, to, to bow and submit to the Lord. Um, last week, talking about the sexuality part of that, in chapter 4, going into verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, uh, what women need, what men need, uh, the blessings of God, because it wasn't here. Uh, in the last part of chapter 5, uh, uh, verse 1 right there, um, the words are there that says, eat, friends, drink, um, and in, imbibe deeply, O lovers, uh, the blessing of God pronounced upon them right there. And when we do it God's way, we'll get the blessing of God. When we choose not to do it God's way, then God can't bless your disobedience and he can't bless mine. So you and I have to make a decision on who we're going to honor. Are we going to honor the Lord? Are we going to honor self? And we're going to honor the world in which we live. Um, and so we got to come to terms with that. You've got to come to terms with it. So many of us struggle in life. We're in addictions, we're in different things, and we won't get honest with ourselves. Um, we're in relationship after relationship after relationship. We're moving on and we're chasing all the things in the world instead of chasing what God wants for us. And we miss what God really has for us because we don't put our priorities in order and get it right with God. It's okay to say, I'm broken. It's okay to say, you know, there's things in my life and my marriage and all of that it, just in life that's messed up. It's okay to do that. And so, uh, you know, Proverbs talks about, and I, I love that passage in Proverbs chapter 5, where it talks about the fact that you and I are to be intoxicated uh, with the love of our spouse. Um, you know, that word intoxicated, when you think about it and you think about what an alcoholic or an addict does, in fact, of what that does in their life and, and causes the reaction, the intoxication that you and I are to be totally consumed by that, uh, by the love of our spouse, and to really think about what God wants. Uh, this morning I entitled it, After You Say I Do, and then After the Old Wow. After You Say I Do, and After the Old Wow, because it's coming. Uh, you know, that moment of saying I do, the commitment, the journey, the honeymoon, all of that, the consummation of marriage, that's all part of the old wiles. I mean, the planning of a wedding and getting into that and really thinking about marriage and, and dreaming about that. But so many times we don't get down to the basis of what marriage really is and how to bring two lives that have been raised in total different areas maybe and, and two different families with all kinds of values that are different and bring them together and let them learn how to live together under the leadership of God. See, here's the thing. Before they get married, they think uh, life is full of sandy beaches, nice sunsets, great sunrises, nice tan bodies, sitting on the beach, watching the ocean, having the waves come in, sitting there sipping a, a cold soda or something. And that's the way we begin to think. But oh, when we put the ring on, and the next day, and the next week, and the next year, when things kind of go awry, we say, oh boy, oh me. The oh wow becomes an oh me. And we begin to wonder about the reality of, of what it is because marriage is not always a nice tan. Uh, you know, most of the time when you get on further down in life, you don't look like you did when you got married. You, you don't have, you know, the, the same features. Your features change. Um, and, and, you know, here's the thing. I'll talk to you about it a little bit more. The thing is, when we're married several years down the road, 10, 20, 30 years, we ought to be doing the same thing we were doing in the first two years to stay, stay vibrant in our relationships. So that's what that's talking about. And, you know, I read something this week, and it just kind of hit home to me. Um, do you refresh your spouse? Think about that. If you're in a relationship, do you refresh, uh, refresh that person that you're in a relationship with? 
Or do you bring a burden or cause complaints or create problems? I'll take you back to the question I've asked for weeks. Are you where God wants you to be right now? If not, why? Because if you answer that question, you're probably going to find out why the complaints and the issues and the problems are there. And, and you begin to think about life. And you begin to think about what God really wants to do. You remember those that's been here for weeks, the little foxes, in chapter 2, verse 15? If you don't, then go back and read that passage on your own time. But the little foxes come in and destroy the vineyard. They run through and, uh, to and fro and they destroy the vines of the vineyards. And, and the warning was there to beware of the little foxes. Because they'll slip in on a daily basis and the reality of what may come. And, and you may say, well, what are those little foxes? Complacency, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, pro, uh, procrastination. Some of us are easy of saying, hey, I'll get it done tomorrow. I'll get it done. I'll do it. Um, the little things in life that um, irritate one another. Leaving our shoes out in the middle of the floor. Leaving the dirty clothes where we pull them off. Leaving your wet towels on the floor. Not taking care of the dishes. Leaving them on the table. Some people get married and because mama took and served them at their table, they think that whoever they married ought to serve them at the table. They don't know they got to get up and fix their own plate. They, they don't realize all of that. And, and little foxes that creep in. And, and then you say, well, you're not going to fix my plate? No, get up and do your own stuff. Little fox. Little fox. Little fox creeps in and, and it makes a crack right there. And then a big one, lying. Lying. Even little lies. You know, and, and a half truth is a whole lie. And you're going to get caught going to get caught. Not respecting. Uh, taking one another for granted. Little foxes. Uh, financial issues that we don't disclose. Um, I was dealing with a couple this week and we were talking about some things and, and they said, what is the most important thing in marriage? And I said two things. Communication and dealing with finances. How do you deal with finances? You get on a budget and you stick to it. And they said, well, you know, I don't like this type uh, program and I don't like this program. I said, well, here's one. Here, here's what you do. You find one that works. This was a 24-year-old guy. His wife is about the same age. He has a desire to be entrepreneur. I met him for the first time this week. And, and I, I told him, I said, you know, you sit down and then you make your budget and your budget drives your finances and you can't argue. Because you've agreed on it. And so the reality of life is going to come. That's what I want you to see. It's after the I do's. It's after the old wows. It's after the honeymoon. When everything is glorious. And we get down to brass tacks. You know, it's uh, not always crystal clear. And uh, the busyness of life <laughs> just begins to set in. And, and, and we begin to really figure out what's going on. So I want to give you some topics this morning. I want to speak to you based on the Word of God in verse 2 through 8 this morning. And again, I want to encourage you to go back and, and really take a look. Um, because there are going to be some oh me moments. There are going to be some times when you say, I didn't really know it was going to be like this. What are you going to do? I've had people sit in my office from time to time. I, I had one uh, in Monticello that... They got married, and, and the male had some health issues. And they knew it going in, but then the female couldn't deal with it. And they walked away because of the health issues. See, we like to talk about um, all of the, the good things. Uh, we like to talk about all the prosperity. We think somehow it's going to be golden years right off the bat, but we don't like to talk about the adversity. We don't like to deal with the adversity. We don't think about the adversity so the first thing I want you to think about this morning is real marriage in a real world. You could put relationships, real relationships in a real world right there. I mean, after, you think about it, after the honeymoon, after the oh wow moments, uh, the couple comes back and they settle into place. What happens? 
Works, work begins, uh, schedules begin to, to come into place, and they get set, and then we have to deal with finances, and then we got to deal with health and real life. Real life sets in. And, and this is exactly what Solomon and Shulamith experienced. Exactly what we see there uh, in verse 2 when we're talking about this from a standpoint of that. What we find is that, um, think about it now, there's 111 verses left. Uh, 88 of which Shulamith does the talking. 88 of which she does the, the talking. And so, uh, you know, uh, we followed them all the way through. Their meeting, their courtship, uh, the, the marriage, the engagement, all of that stuff. We followed it through. And uh, here's the deal. So many marriages, so many couples, so many relationships have false expectations. They have false uh, uh, goals, if you will, or false fantas fantasies. Their, their fantasies are there. And then they get married and the reality is there. So what we find in verse 2, let's just kind of talk about it. Shulamith was asleep. It was late at night, probably after midnight. We, you know, scholars think that, that it was late at night. Uh, Solomon had come home late. Um, his head was drenched with dew, uh, his locks or water. What in the world does that mean? Well, in that part of the world, about midnight, there's a heavy dew every night. That's what really refreshes the plants because of the, the, the seasonal activity and the fact of the heat and all of that kind of stuff. The heavy dew falls and it refreshes everything. And so he's outside and he's coming in and he's knocking at the door. He's knocking, and uh, he uses his poetic language. You know, he's done good with that so far, and uh, it's late. So he says, open to me, my dove, my perfect one. I mean, he is talking, uh, he's using that language, but it didn't work. It didn't work this time. And so uh, when you begin to just think about it, I mean, let's just think in real moments. Shulamith probably had waited up for him. Uh, she had gotten tired and, and laid down, and it was, sleep, uh, it was late, so she had gone to sleep. And the reality is she was ticked off. That's a good southern term, right? That, she was ticked off. And so uh, she had drifted off to sleep. And so uh, can I get a witness this morning? Any guys, especially before cell phones, get home to find um, your wife in the bed asleep? Maybe your supper's in the refrigerator or a plate left out or whatever because she had planned uh, for you to get home. And you didn't let her know that you were going to be late. And uh, so she waited up until she gave up. Uh, I know that's happened in our life, in our marriage. I, I, even in the day of cell phones, Selena called and said, where you at? How come you're not home? You know, it's worse. To, uh, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if I want to use the term worse. Uh, it's as challenging it is today because of the cell phones, because of the fact of being able to be in contact. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you didn't get the hello. You didn't get the good night. <laughs> you didn't get the welcome home. And you certainly didn't get any extracurricular activity, right? I, I had a friend that used to run my Firestone store, and he'd say, uh, you know, after 8 o'clock, sex is out at my house. He got to be home early. No extracurricular activity. So, I mean, um, that's what Solomon faced. Let's just be real. That's the word of God. You know, uh, you may say, well, that's kind of awkward looking at that, you know, and talking about that. Aren't you glad that's in the word of God? Aren't you glad that God just deals with it and God's not afraid to deal with it? Now, the reality is Solomon probably got held up at the palace office. Now, he could have sent a servant over to tell her that, hey, I'm going to be late, but evidently he didn't. And he's doing the king's stuff, right? And, uh, you know, he had, uh, I mean, he had spoiled everything for the evening. I mean, she had it planned out. So here's the deal. What do we learn from that? Be careful with complacency. The little fox I talked about a moment ago. Uh, the fact that we take each other for granted, um, that, that's a big deal. Be careful with complacency. Um, you know, in the beginning, isn't it amazing how we do the, the little things to make ourself desirable? Isn't it maybe the time uh, you ever relate to this where uh, you guys that are married and spouses, uh, you go into the bathroom, maybe one leaves and goes to work early, and you write something on the bathroom mirror, and the other one comes in and finds it later? You get a special text nowadays, uh, or you get a special note in your lunchbox, 
uh, when you're working and you open that up and wow, you got a little note. But the sad part about that is complacency sets in and we begin to drop the little things that really matter. We, we, we begin to just take one another for granted. And, and we get in trouble um, because routines become ruts. <laughs> Isn't it amazing when we think about complacency and begin to take everybody for granted? And, uh, you know, I mean, the truth is sometimes things happen, right? You can't help that. Um, you know, Selena, I'll just be honest. Gets irritated when I don't answer my phone and she calls. And I try to answer it every single time when I see her. Matter of fact, if I'm in a meeting and her or the kids call, I'm usually going to answer it if I can. Uh, and, uh, but she gets aggravated when I don't help that. I mean, when I don't answer that. And sometimes I can't help it. But I, I try to answer it, you know. And, and here's the deal. Let's look at the reality. Sometimes the, the job trumps the things at home. But it doesn't need to become the norm. It, it doesn't begin, need to become everything that, that every day. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you don't do that often. Uh, don't take your spouse and your family for granted. You don't know when it's going to end. I wonder what would happen. You know, I... I, uh, I said Sunday, um, um, this week when I was doing that funeral on Thursday, and I've used the question here, and probably every pastor has, I just stopped in the middle of the funeral, and I just felt like, I mean, there were some things going on inside the funeral, and there were some people, just different things going on, I won't get in details, but I just said, let me ask you something. If you knew your life was going to end this, after, this evening at 9 o'clock, what would you do different? The funeral was at 2, and that was probably about 2.15, 2.20. I said, you got a little less than seven hours. What would you do? What would you do? So I proposed that to you this morning. What would you do if you knew your life was ending today at 6 p.m.? What difference would it make in your life? What would you do different? There's four things that I want to give you. It's in your worship guide that, guys, your wife needs. Your wife needs, and, and, and writers, Bob and Yvonne Turnbull, write this, and, and their book, it's a good book for you, it's entitled Teammates, it's entitled uh, Bidding Your Marriage uh, to, com to Complete and Not Compete, all right? So it's a good book, and they, and they talk about these four things. The first thing they talk about is time, time, devotion, spending time together, uh, just giving time listening. You know, we, we know that uh, in, in a normal day, a, a lady's going to speak about two to three times more words than a man. <laughs> but just to sit down and talk. Did I get, somebody said amen. I don't know who said that. Was that Brad back there? I put him on the spot. But he can do that because Frida's in the back. But she's watching. So uh, time, devotion. I don't know that was him, y'all. So anyway, <laughs> listen to that. Um, Devotion, just, just sitting down and listening. Ask them how their day is, how their day went, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, listen to them, spend time together, um, and, and just, just talk a little bit, all right? Uh, that's number one. Number two is the word talk. <laughs> Words of affirmation. We talked about that last week. I encourage you to go back and look at that because in Solomon's discourse or poetry, to uh, Shulamith, those words and the perfumes and all of that, they all had significant meanings. Words of affirmation, words of approval, built into that. So I challenge you to talk. Number three, tenderness. Some of you guys, we had a conversation about that just a few weeks ago about being tender. So you protect and nourish. You protect and nourish. That ain't heard. I don't know where Patrick got that, but uh, it's heard. So don't write herd there. That's probably in the worship guide too. But uh, protect and nourish. I guess he was thinking about the goats because he had a conversation about the goats with the long back hair. And uh, so, <laughs> but protect and nourish her. So you folks that are listening online uh, and watching all the notes online. So, uh, and then the touch. Now he's done took my notes completely down. Uh, not sexual, Okay. Just loving, just, just hug her. Sometimes they just need a hug. And guys, most of us don't do any one of those four enough. I'm going to be honest. 
we don't do enough of that right there. Uh, we, don't, we don't affirm enough. We don't spend enough time talking. Uh, the tenderness of that, um, the just loving and hugging, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just telling you, most of us don't do it. Um, and so I'm in that mix. I'm putting myself in the mix. So learn to be a teammate, to complete each other. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So real meaning in a real world, in a real marriage. It's a big deal. Okay, let me take you to the second thing. It's in verse 3. Rejections. Rejections in marriage. You see the rejection that took place. Um, there she is in bed. Uh, she says, you know, I'm already in bed. Basically what she said, I've taken off my dress. I don't want to put it on again. I wash my feet, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I'm in bed. Leave me alone. Um, here's what the deal is, guys. It's like coming home and our wife says, uh, I got a headache. And they turn over and go the other direction. That's, that's what it really means. That's, that's in our terms, okay? I don't feel well. Turn over and go the other direction. Uh, that, that's what that means. And so she's upset. She's ticked off. And really what she wants to do is pay back. She's trying to pay back. And, and uh, she's thinking, why should I get up for him? Look what he did. He could have been here earlier, uh, and, and he didn't come home. And so uh, she's actually just really rejecting him from that standpoint. And uh, she's returning the rejection for what she thinks Solomon did to her and to them by not coming home earlier. Now, here's a principle I want you to see, and I'm not even, I'm not even sure it's in your notes. Um, vengeance and retaliation have no place in marriage or serious relationships. They have no place in that. Um, forgiveness ought to be the forefront. You could put any relationship in there. Uh, vengeance and retaliation have no place. What does Romans 12, 19 say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And God will do a much better job of, re of avenging than you and I ever will. And so, uh, you know, you're thinking about the fact of who God is and our relationships and our forgiveness and all of that. Um, there, let me say something to you. There's nothing God can't heal or won't heal in your life if you'll just let him. If you'll just let him. If you will let God do it, if we will get out of the way, if I will get out of the way and let God do it, he'll do a much better job. And, and here's the thing. We've got to get honest. So many of us want to live a lie. The first part of it is getting honest with ourselves, getting honest with God, and then getting honest with our spouse or our mate from that standpoint. So, uh, but here's the reality. We get hurt, or we feel like we get sucker punched, and the reality is we want to retaliate. We want to make it harder on them than the hurt that we experienced. And here's what I want you to remember, because here's what happens in arguments. We want to win at all costs a lot of times. But when somebody wins, somebody else always loses. And that's not the way marriage is supposed to be. You need to think about that. If you don't write anything else down, write that down. When somebody else, when somebody wins, somebody else loses. And, you know, what, go, I asked you last week to go look at 1 Corinthians 13. And it talks about the love there. And I usually share that in every ceremony that I do uh, because I think it's an underlying principle. But in there it says, you know, love's not self-seeking. It's not boastful. Uh, it, it, love does not brag. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Think about that. Think about what, God's do, uh, what God really wants to do in our life. Now, I talked to you about the four things that women need. Let me give you ladies four things that your guy needs. I want to stay equal there. Four things that the guy needs, and I think you'll agree with this. He wants you to be his cheerleader. I mean, a man thrives, a husband thrives on his wife's approval. It does me good when Selena gives me approval. Be his cheerleader. Whatever it takes, be his cheerleader. We say some bad things where we're mad and upset and, and not really thinking about what God uh, in our life. We say some nasty things. We call people things that we shouldn't call them. We call our spouse things that we should never say. Never say. I talked to you about language last week. Some of the language that's used today in today's world would have never been said in yesteryear. And we tend to use some horrible, horrific language towards husbands and wives. Be his cheerleader. I mean, think about what he, what he needs and just, just lift him up. Be his companion. Number two, uh, be his companion, um, you know, his best friend. Go, go hang out. 
Um, you know, that, that goes back to the time. Here's the thing, what ought to happen in a marriage. You do it not because you like it. You do it because you love spouse. You hang out. You do things that they like to do because you love them. That's why you do what you do. Uh, you love God first, and then you do the things each other likes because you love God and you love each other. So you want to, to spend time together and you find ways that you can do it and be the companion. Uh, ladies, we need that. Be next to him. Reach over and grab his hand. Reach over and grab his arm. Uh, take hand in hand, those kinds of things. Uh, we need that. And so I encourage you to do that. Be his best friend. You know, guys don't open up in a lot of different ways. They're afraid to open up because they're afraid it makes them th uh, seem weak. And they need to be able to open up to you. They need to share their deepest, darkest secrets, and you need to be there to listen. And you're his cheerleader. And you're his companion. And you're his champion. Be his champion. Be, be the person that he really wants you to be. Uh, defend your husband. Pr pr promote him. Lift him up. Let him count on you. Let him know that you're in his court. Um, let him know you're in his corner at every turn of the road. Uh, and, and some of us need to go back and do some apologizing in the, in the midst of that. Um, just to kind of line some things up, to be a cheerleader, to be that uh, champion, to be the companion. And then the last thing is to be his complement. Complete him. Complete your husband. What does the word of God say? That God brings us together, the, hus the, the man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Be his complement. Completion. Complete your husband. Be there when everything else falls apart. Now, some of us need to back up and, and really look at life and look at kind of where we made some mistakes. And, and uh, you know, you're not bringing up the past. You're just dealing with some past. And you've got to be honest in the midst of that. And, and you begin to complete one another, and you're not in competition in regards to that. So uh, pity parties, let me just go ahead and tell you, pity parties damage relationships. So many times we want to get on a pity party, and we want to stay on it for days on end. That damages relationships. And rejection damages relationships. That's why the Bible tells us to deal with the conflict before the sun goes down, if at all possible. The third thing that I want to give you this morning is found really in verse 4. And it has to do with retaliation. Here's the deal. Retaliation will lead to regret. It will lead to regret. Um... You see the reality is Solomon tried to unlatch the door. The word of God says that he put his hand, um, extended his hand through the opening, he tried to unlatch the door. Uh, Shulamith really wanted him to unlatch the door. Shulamith's desire was him to unlatch the door. But what got in the way? Pride. Pride. Pride got in the way. And that's exactly what happens in our relationship so many times is the fact that we don't say, I'm sorry. We don't ask somebody to forgive us. Or we don't, we don't admit our shortcomings. Pride keeps people from Jesus and it keeps people from having healed relationships. Pride gets in the way. It keeps couples apart. It keeps them out of uh, the relationship. And so what happened was Shulamith uh, just uh, regretted not opening the door. She really wanted it to happen. And let me just make a statement to you. Don't wait until it's too late <laughs> to do the mending. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until they walk away. Deal with it. Broken marriages and relationships can be fixed. They can be repaired. You and I, through the love of God and the grace of God, our lives can be restored. There's nobody that cannot be restored. I mean, think about the person that you've given up on. There's still hope. They got to get to Jesus. But don't wait too late to, uh, to, to mend what needs to happen. And so many of us need to learn to forgive and to trust and to move forward. I'm not saying it's easy. Somebody's probably saying, you just don't understand. I may not can understand exactly where you are because I haven't walked where you walk, but I tell you what, I've walked with a lot of people beside them. 
And if you'll just relinquish authority in your life, turn it over to God, and then get people to surround you who will love you and hold you up, you can come through. But you've got to do it the way God wants it done. It's not going to work any other way. I see Derek walked in right here. Derek, you can testify to that, right? Thank God for that guy. He's like a son to me, and he knows that. But there was a time I had to walk away from him. But I thank God that he brought him full circle. And now he's got a wife and a family and a good job. If we would just trust the Lord, we may end up in prison. <laughs> We may end up in the gutters of life. But what does the Bible say? That God is there to reach down his hand and lift us up. Lift us up. The reality of life. Retaliation will lead to regret. Let me give you the last thing and we'll be done. I want to talk to you about regret to renewal. Regret to renewal. I want to talk to you about being resilient in life. And the resiliency that you find in the Word of God this morning is in verse 8 when, when Shulam says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, to find my beloved. And, and, when, and when you find him, then you tell him that I'm, I'm lovesick. I'm ready for him to come back. Resiliency. Don't give up. Don't give up on any relationships. <laughs> Don't give up on, on what God really wants you to do in your life. You know, when you think about the hurts of life, they're real and they're deep. But there's light. And sometimes that light may be very dim and very small. But as a born-again believer, there is a ray of light. And the closer you and I run to the light, the bigger it's going to get. So many times we find ourselves way away because we've moved. And so I want, you know, in these last few statements, time is everything in life. Time. There's no guarantee for tomorrow, but I guarantee you when we got up this morning, me, you, and every one of us in here, we automatically assume that we're going to see the sun set tonight, we're going to go to sleep, and we're going to see the sun rise in the morning. We automatically assume that. But what if we don't? What if we don't? I hadn't looked to see, but I guarantee I'm going to know at least one of the three. Now, Celine probably hadn't even seen this, but on Saturday, Lakeland Drive in Jackson, there was a police chase, and I may not have all the details right. But in the police chase, the car went down the wrong side of the highway and it hit a car with three individuals in it. I don't know if they're all three were from Brookhaven, but I know one of them that was. Killed all three of them. I can guarantee you that those three individuals just a few minutes before didn't know what was fixing to happen. They didn't. They didn't know what was fixing to take place in their life. So I challenge you, don't wait any longer. Do, do whatever it takes to get to the right thing, and the right thing is the God thing. And what happened was that Shulamith realized the right thing. She realized what had happened. And I told you I was going to mention verse 7. We don't really understand why it's in here, but here's what we think. Our scholars tell us. When it says, the watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me, they struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took me away with my shawl for me. Uh, what they think is that it's like a nightmare. Why is the nightmare there? Because she let she, uh, Solomon walk. And she didn't deal with it on time. And she let him walk and she had a nightmare. And it was about the fact that she's out searching, can't find him. And then she got, you know, uh, beat up or abused from that standpoint of what took place. And so she was in the midst of like a dream and what was taking place there. So, you know, when you think about what's taking uh, place in your life, 
what needs to happen. Because the reality is she loved him and he loved her. And they're going to get back together. The marriage is going to be healed and it's going to be rebound and it's going to be restored. And she had changed her mind. Her thoughts were far different now than what they were just hours earlier or moments earlier when she was ready to just throw in the towel. Regret to renewal. Let me give you a caution. Be careful of the you go girl advisors. If you have a chance, you can go back and look at Fireproof and several of the other Kendrick films and You'll find a few things in there where there's some problems in a marriage. and You remember at one case they were in a nurse's situation and they were saying, you know, you just leave him alone and go on about your business and he don't care about you. That's the go-girl advisors. Guys, you stay away from the uh, man do what you want advisors. Forget her. That's not God. It's not God speaking in your life. If you're in that position this morning, you really need to think about where you are. Those that are listening online this morning, think about that. Because there's so many, and I want to challenge you as born-again Christians this morning. Don't give advice unless it's biblical. If you can't stand and back it up with the Word of God, don't give it. Because you're going to give an account for the advice that you give. And so you stand on the authority and the Word of God. And you try your best to help somebody navigate the principles of wherever they are in life. I'm telling you, people are hurting, not just because of COVID, but because of things in life. And people are hurting. And my heart goes out to them deeply, deeply, deeply. And whether you put a relationship back together, where you put a marriage back together, the, the thing you got to do is do what God says. And you got to forgive and, and, and for, repent and, and get right with the Lord. I talked about the miracles in George Smith's life. Really a miracle in, in some other lives, Johnny and, and Jay and them and all of that. But, you know, I, I want to ask you this morning. You know, do you really believe that God is a miracle God? <laughs> then let him do what he needs to do in your life. Give him the reins. Let, let him do it. Let, let him take complete control because he will. And, 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 you know, just, just line up with him. You know, I, I talked to you about that a few weeks ago. Lining up with God and watch what God does in the midst of those principles. Really thinking how I want to close this morning. Patrick, did we get that video up by chance? Okay. Let me just, uh, let me ask you to bow your heads where you are. I'm not going to move the praise team to the platform. You folks at home, uh, we're going to stay on for right now, but we'll go off in just a minute. Some of you have commented that you're so thankful that we stay on through the invitation. And we're going to do that. And here it is. I'm going to ask you to bow your head where you are. If you're listening at home, just bow your head where you are. And I want you to think about your life. What needs to happen if you know your life is going to end this afternoon at 9 o'clock? First of all, what needs to happen? What do you need to do? And maybe you want to take your worship guide and write it down. If you're at home, maybe you want to take a piece of paper and write it down. What needs to happen? Is there somebody you need to call or somebody that you need to speak to? Or, or maybe there's some repentance or some forgiveness or something like that that needs to take place. Will you do that? Second of all, if you've never been born again, and you can say, Pastor, I know that if I die today, I'm going to spend eternity in hell, separated from God. I want to ask you right now to, for, to ask God to forgive you of your sin. Repent and turn. Turn from that sin. You say it's hard. I, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but there's nothing like it when you turn to God, and he will help you. And you've got to allow people to come around you to support you. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. 
You say, Pastor, I'm a child of God, but my life is so messed up. Cry out to him for forgiveness. Don't let the moment pass. God loves you. He hasn't stopped loving you. He loves you. He loves you. You folks at home, I'd love to hear from you. You can message me. You can message us on the internet. Our folks in the building, I'm about to pray, and we're going to go off the air when I finish the prayer. And, and then we're going to close with a video. But I want you to think about restoration. That's what this video is going to be like, or what it's going to say, but I can't play it on Facebook. So we're going to have to go off. And I'll just tell you folks at home before we go off that you look it up. It's Matthew West, Restored. And I'm going to challenge you to look at it at home. And then our folks are going to get to see it in the building. It's about a five-minute video, but it has so much importance. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. God, against the demon of brokenness, the, de the demon of hurt, the demon of anxiety, the demon of separation, the demon, Lord, of just the complacency, the demon of taking our spouses for granted. God, I pray you would help us to draw close to you, Lord, and you teach us more and more and more about how we're to love you and how we're to love our spouse. As men, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And as women, we're to love our husbands in that same way. And God, to just share that love and to respect one another and to honor one another and to be companions and to, come, uh, to complete one another. So God, I pray you would help us as we study these realities of marriage and life that everything's not going to be uh, prosperity. There's just going to be adversity. But how do we come through? It's the cord of three strands. It's God in the middle. So God, you bless this morning as we share this video in Christ's name. Amen. We haven't already left. We'll leave Facebook Live because we're not.